want to get straight into it today. This series is called The You Revolution. And Bron and I have been sitting on this series for what would seem, well, not what would seem like, what has been a couple of years. It's a series that runs deep in us. Um, it's a series I've sat on for quite a while. I'm just going, I want the right time to deliver this. I believe there's something in it. I, I, I think, I expect that God's going to use it. We just finished the 8.30 service and people were talking about the impact uh, of, of the message on them already. And I believe that across these next six weeks, God wants to do something in your life that maybe hasn't gone on before. And so my prayer is that you will lean in this morning and that you would come open today as we launch into this series. And we, we wanted to, as we came out of, at least for now, um, COVID, and as we launched in each location, we wanted to start this together and to journey together on this series and believe in all locations and in every service. Um, we're doing the same message. And so my kids have been relieved from three services here in Tamworth. Uh, so they don't have to listen to their dad three times. But we're expecting something to go on. Are you ready? Amen. All right. Let me pray and let's get into it. Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, here we are. Your will be done. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, if this doesn't happen now, it will be too late to avoid the catastrophe that's coming. How are you feeling? Good? If this doesn't happen now, it will be too late to avoid the catastrophe that's coming. Those were the words my surgeon said to me as I lay on his operating table and he prepared to remove the cancer from my nose. The good news is that he wasn't talking about my cancer, he was talking about something else. Uh, the, as a surgeon went to work on me just a few months ago, um, he, he made these words in reference to an unfathomable, fathomable, you know the word, imminent and catastrophic reality that is fast tracking towards all of humanity, including you and me. And he was talking to me as I lay on the table. And as I lay there on the surgical table and he got to work on me, he delivered me this, this kind of TED Talk style sermon talk about this imminent threat. The imminent threat was global warming. And as I lay there and as he repeatedly jabbed me with, with needles full of local anaesthetic, 10, 15 needles to numb it, I said, just give me more than I need. I always tell the doctor, Give me more than you think because I can still feel it and that's just a precaution. I'm hoping they fall for it, but they probably know better. And, but as he jabbed me full of uh, local, he talked about the imminent threat and then he, he went into um, talking about the history and the science um, from his perspective behind global warming. And then as he cut and grafted my skin and, and managed the bleeding, he started to talk to me about the, the modelling and the catastrophic consequences that are coming our way in the lifetime of the living. And then as he started to stitch me up and piece me back together, he gave me a call to action. 25 minutes while I'm under the thing and this surgeon has delivered to me a TED talk on global warming, the history, the science, the problem, the catastrophe, a call to action. And I asked the nurse, I said, um, has he done that before? She said, oh, he does it to everybody. And you could tell it was like this finely tuned, beautifully crafted um, talk that went across the time of my surgery, which I was paying for, for him to deliver to me a talk on global warming. And when, as I left, I remember walking outside and as I left the building, I, rem I remember vividly the scene and I had this sense of doom. The, the, the plan he'd articulated was completely doable. I mean, I thought, this is so doable. Humanity can be saved from this catastrophe. It was completely doable. And yet in my heart, I thought, this is impossible. This, this, this isn't going to happen anytime soon. There's a revolution that needs to go on, but there's something standing in the way of it. And I started to think about it and I started to dwell upon it and I, I thought of, here's the one thing that stands out to me, that the revolution that should happen won't happen because of this, this one thing, self-interest. 
at every level. When, 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 when I thought about it, even though it was completely doable, it was, seemed impossible because, you know, leaders of nations and po- um, people in the corridors of power, uh, leaders of industry and even common everyday people who have the ability to change their life, I, I recognise that there's inaction everywhere. Even though it's imminent, even though the fallout is unthinkable, the, 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 the humanity at the highest places of government, of industry, and even the common man are behaving like the threat is to somebody else, somewhere else in another time other than now. And it really, at the core of it, in my view, comes down to self-interest. But, but it's not just self-interest. It's actually something worse than that. It's, it's, it's short-term self-interest. Because actually, what's in all of our best interests is that we have a global warming revolution, isn't it? That's, that's actually what's in our best interests, is that, that we have a global warming revolution go on so that we can continue to move into the future. But even though it's in our best interests, humanity chooses to live in self-interest. Short-term self-interest that isn't even in our best interests. Does that sound crazy to you? Because that sounds crazy to me. And so I, I want you to hold that thought because revolution can happen um, in our lifetime. Hold that thought and now consider this. So I, I believe God would work a revolution in the days in which we live. I do. I believe it with all my heart. I, I, Bron will tell you, it's written down. I read it every other day. I've been praying about it for a while now. I believe God will walk a, work a revolution in our days. In fact, our, our church is even geared for the beginnings of it. This series um, the new revolution, but even the way, you know, I think that God will work a revolution that repositions the church for its God, a point of future. I think that God would work a revolution that reshapes the spiritual landscape of our nation. I believe he would do that in our days. I believe this can be a Joshua generation. I'm happy to be Joshua. I'm up for that. Um, and and that the generation of the living and the generation of merging would see a, a revolution go on in our days. I mean, it's kind of God's specialty, isn't it? God's specialty has always been when it looks like Christianity is on the decline in a culture, God's specialty from the dawn of time to this very moment has always been across the ages, across the world and across cultures to take where he finds a people who will live heart and soul for him and to work a revolution in a generation that sees people come to faith in the risen Jesus. That's who he is and that's what he does. And I believe he would do it in our time, like now. I wrote a plan last year at 48 years old. I've told Brian I'm planning to die on my 89th year. I'm going to finish Hillsong Conference because it's about this time of year. And the next day, I said I'm going to fall asleep and go to eternity. I don't know if God's up for that plan. Hope he is. I might not think that at 89, but right now, seems like a good idea. But the reason it's 89, I'm like 40 years. Man, God could work a revolution in 40 years. But I think there's another revolution he wants to go. I think it's in his people. I think that God wants to work an internal, a personal revolution in you and in me um, that really is transformative in our lives. And I think that this, I believe God will work a revolution in us and in his church and in your life. And what stands between it, really what stands between revolution and where we stand right now, I believe is this, self-interest. Self-interest. When I think about my own life, most of where I've messed it up, most of where I've gotten it wrong, most of the fights where I've been in the wrong with Bron, which is very few, but on those rare moments when I've been in the wrong, about every four and a half years, or minutes, <laughs> um, it, if you boil it down, you could bring it, most of it back to self-interest, where I've gone astray, where I've gone my own, you can bring it back to that. If you think about your life as well, that, that the reality is that a whole lot of what that has gone on if you're a believer in Jesus that keeps you from really uh, the center of his will. A whole lot of what's going, going on, we can pull back to self-interest. And, 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 and so I, I, I want to let that go for a moment, come back to that as we talk about revolution and talk about a you revolution. Because whether we talk large-scale revolution, like the repositioning of the church or the reshaping of the landscape or a revolution in you, it starts in the same place. It starts with the individual. It starts with the person. That's how revolution has always happened, whether it's a God-inspired revolution or just a humanly driven revolution. It always starts in a person and a people who get something on the inside. And I think that's what God will do 
with this series. A you revolution, a revolution that shifts everything. This is not a series of subtleties. I believe that you and I stand in a moment where revolution can go on and it starts within. And it will transform who we are. It'll transform what we're about and it'll transform the future in front of us. And for some of us in the room today and some of us online today, where you are, some of us just need to get sick enough of where it's at right now for a transformation to go on, a revolution that is generated by the Spirit of God in the hearts of people that would set up their lives for their God-appointed future. A you revolution going on in you. When I think revolution, I think, well, what do you think? When you think of revolution, what do you think? Here's what I think. When I think revolution, I think of radically, radically reshaped landscapes. I think of forever shifted realities. I think of disrupted and reimagined industries. I really do think of that. Oh, I love that. Read a book this week about that. That's, I think of things that have been so shaken up of, of bold activists and of, and, of, and of profound change. That's what I think of. Of powerfully transformed people and places, of circumstances and periods in history. When I think revolution, I think those kinds of things. I think we live in that kind of day. And I think God would do that kind of work in you and that kind of work in me and that kind of work in a generation of the living and the emerging. That's what he would do in our days. And I believe this morning, today as we gather, wherever you gather, that the Holy Spirit is in that place and the Holy Spirit will go to work. If you'll just open your heart and say, here I am, God, I'm actually open. Even if you're not sure that you believe, even if you've been in rebellion all of your life, if you will do that today, something is about to go on that will forever reposition your life for its God-appointed future. So I would define revolution this way. A future reality, barely recognisable, with its previous state. A future reality, barely recognisable with its previous state. I mean, we might look the same, we might sound the same, although as you get older, your voice might get rougher like mine, but it's barely recognisable. And, and I think that's the kind of thing that God wants to go on in terms of who we are, in terms of what we're about, in terms of what, what our story might be. So as we launch this series, that's what's about today about a revolution, yours, in Jesus' name. Powerfully transforming who we become, profoundly reshaping what we're about and setting in motion the kind of life that can only be lived with God intrinsically in the mix. So think about your life for a moment, life as it is, who you are, where you're at, what you're about. I want you to think about that. Would you say your life is like, living in the zone, like you are right there. This is where, this is where life is meant to be at. Do you, are you there right now in who you are and where it's at, what you're about? Um, I love this quote by the Olympic runner, Eric Liddell. He, some of you will know from the movie Chariots of Fire. He said this, he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Oh, I love that thought. Now, when I run, I don't feel any pleasure and I don't think God does either. I feel pain. It's awful. I love exercise, but I hate running. You can see that I am not built to run. But Eric Liddell, he says he was an Olympic runner who believed in the Sabbath so much that he stood by it. Now, I'm not here to have a debate about the Sabbath because Romans actually says you can go either way on the Sabbath. So that's not a debate we need to have. But for him in his heart, he believed in the Sabbath. He wouldn't run on the Sabbath. He was an Olympic champion, or, or it should be. And he tells his story. Fastest man in the world, standing by his convictions. And he would say, I hear God's pleasure when I run. And we look with the chasm of time back on Eric Liddell's story and, and the fact that maybe some of you are a bit young, but some of you are a bit older, you can remember the movie Chariots of Fire. Can any of you remember the movie Chariots of Fire? And, and you can think of the soundtrack. It's so embedded into the psyche. The movie was so big. Could Eric Liddell, who felt the pleasure of God when he ran, possibly have thought that the end of that story is that beyond his lifetime, they would release a movie about the man who wouldn't run at the Sabbath, but made it to the Olympics 
and talking about how he feels the pleasure of God, when he runs, do you think he could have thought that that would be the case, that it would be an Oscar-winning movie, that it would be shown around the world, that even all these years later, there's a whole bunch of people in this room and your room who can think of the soundtrack like that. Oh, God's amazing in what he can do. The revolution for Eric Liddell continues to go on beyond his lifetime. That's the kind of God we serve and the kind of God we know, and that's the kind of God who is calling you and I to himself. Now, I want to say something as we think about this. Where where are you at right now? Do you feel like you're in the zone? Or, Or is it more like this? Would you say, I'm not quite there yet? You, you, I'm, Darren, I'm not quite there yet. I, you might feel like you're a million miles away or you might feel like you're a couple of degrees away from it, but in your heart you'd say, I'm not quite there yet. And, and, and I want to appeal to the not quite yet, there yet because I think that's where God would go to work on us. The not quite there yet, the, the, the degree by which we're not in the zone, the, the million miles away by which we're not in the zone. And I, I wonder if what's going on there is a hint that is placed there by God. And I think he wants to bring clarity to the hint as a revolution goes on in our heart and life. God has a life he calls you to. There's a life that can only be lived with God intrinsically in the mix. You know who, um, I was talking to someone and, um, uh, close to me and they, they, they were a follower of Jesus and aren't at this point in time. And they said to me, when we're talking about something, he said, oh, there's a life that can only be lived with God. That's what you're all about, Darren. I thought, isn't that incredible that he, someone who was a million miles from in the zone right now, fully recognised that there is a life that only exists with God intrinsically in the mix actually at the centre. So I want to talk to you in this week one of this six-week series about your you revolution. I want to talk about the one thing that stands in the way and the one thing that sets up our you revolution. One thing that stands in the way and the one thing that sets it up. So let's go to the one thing that stands in the way. The one thing above everything that stands in the way of a you revolution that can go on and God would have go on in our lives. I think it's this. I think it's the same thing that stands in the way of global revolution, of global warming revolution. I think it's self-interest. I think it's self-interest. I think the biggest threat to my revolution, my you revolution and yours, is self-interest. We're going to see from Scripture that, that this could well be the case. But I give it a name, and that name I used years ago, some of you would have heard of it, called the I God Phenomenon. The I God. In the age of iPad and iPod, now iPods are dead, aren't they? iPhone, and you can think of the rest of the eyes. In the age of I, the biggest one of them all, I think, is the I God Phenomenon. A life lived in self interest, in I amness, dominated or lived by degrees by me, myself, and mine. Do you know what I'm talking about today? I think it's a great threat to our you revolution. Self-interest, even at the expense of our best interests. Like as a people of faith or someone who's curious about God, in our best interest, in yours and mine, is a God-centered life. That's actually in your best interest. It's, it's in your best interest for the here and now. And it's in our best interest, certainly for eternity, which is coming at us fast. It's in our best interest, but short-term self-interest even for us, puts us at risk of that future and of the revolution that God would bring on. A person's you revolution is sparked in its rebellion to this. That's like, that's where it's sparked. It's like, I'm done with self-interest. I'm done with I amness. I'm done with life being by degrees or mainly about me, myself and mine. I'm done with that. I'm going to live in rebellion to it. I'm going to cut against the grave, gray, uh, what is it? Grain. I'm not going to go with the flow. I'm making a stand and I'm going God's way. Now, the the risk with this message is to think that I'm talking to new believers or not yet believers. I'm talking to everybody. We're we're going to go to an account that gives us a key uh, from Jesus. And Jesus is talking, making this statement just a day before his death. So whether I'm brand new in the faith or whether I've been doing this since before Adam walked the earth, 
regardless of where I sit along the spectrum, there is something in this for us as it relates to I amness, I God phenomenon, and what we're going to look at next. But stay with me for a minute, because I think this is the God of our age. People in our nation, there are lots of religions, but the, the, the average Aussie isn't worth worshipping a wooden idol. The, 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 those days are gone. The, the centre of people's lives is not a foreign God. It's not a dead God. It's self. The, God, the age of I God. And so, but you know, the, the, it's elevated, it's celebrated. But on deeper inspection, in many ways, it's the cause of pain. It's the creator of chaos. It's where exploitation comes from. Violence, war, unfaithfulness in all its form, oppression, etc. I could go on. More subtly, I think it pulls at the fabric of society. It pulls at the fabric of family and, and community. And it, and it certainly pulls us in a direction other than our God-appointed future. On a personal level, I think it's insidious and deceptive and works against, as we've talked about, our own best interests. And along the way, I, God, living, will pay a high price, too high a price, I think, and for some people will cost them their souls. But it doesn't need to be this way. We're here today for a revolution to go on. We're here today that God wants to do something and change something. So let, let's think about this. Let me take you quickly on a walk through this. Because although it's exploded as the God of our age, it has its roots in before time began. Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 15. I'm going to paraphrase from it. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will be like the most high. And then it goes on and says, but yet you shall be brought down the shoal to the lowest depths. You know, the I God phenomenon, phenomenon had its inception before humanity had even breathed a breath. And then it has its roots in human history. At the beginning of the human story, when humanity was deceived and rebelled, the first humans, Deception came in and the deception was this. They made it all about them. They made it all about them to the exclusion of God and to the detriment of humanity. And they chose self, that they would get wisdom, that they would see, and they chose self over God. And the rest is history. The I-God phenomenon has its in had its inception before humanity had breathed a breath. It has its roots in the beginning of our story. It has threaded its way across the ages. Listen to this from Isaiah 47, verses 8 to 10. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. Well, clearly, they don't mean there is no one else besides me because they were surrounded by people. They mean no one else above me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Their arrogance in, in self. But, but these two things shall come to you in a day, in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and widowhood. And they shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries, for the great abundance of your enchantments, for you have trusted in your wickedness. Now listen to this. This is a bit I want to bring us to. You have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge have warped you. And you have said in your heart, I am and there is no one else beside me. The eye God phenomenon has weaved its way, threaded its way through the ages. And then the eye God phenomenon is at the core of God's redemptive plan. It's the reason for what Jesus did. Isaiah 53 verses 5 and 6 say, He, speaking of Jesus, Jesus was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. It's talking about the cross and his death. All we like sheep have gone astray. Listen to this next sentence. Here lies the reason that God set his redemptive plan in motion. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, as a result, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've all just gone our way, done our thing, and there lies the problem. The I God phenomenon is at the core of God's redemptive plan. And here's the last thought before we come to a solution. The I God phenomenon has exploded as the God of our age. Listen to this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living 
and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Speaking to Timothy, he says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Listen to this next line. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. What an incredible, crazy thought. I've always said to Brian, if I ever did walk away from Jesus, praying that I never do, but if I did decide to walk away, I like to think that I wouldn't pretend and stay, that I wouldn't pretend to be a believer and at least if I'm here, I'd be honest about where I'm at because I don't want to do that. I don't want to just create, build teachers around me who say the things I want to hear so I feel comfortable in where I'm at. The I God phenomenon has exploded as the God of our age and even infiltrated Jesus' church. And the Bible said it was so then and it predicted it would be so now. And there's a better way that God calls us to a rebellion against the I God idea that sets up our you revolution. So that's the one thing that stands in the way. Here's the one thing that sets us up for you revolution to go on. Luke chapter 22. Jesus is in the garden. Verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may enter, not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. I mean, what he was about to go through. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then the scripture goes on. Not my will, but yours be done. These seven words set you revolution in motion. Not my will, but yours be done. There it is. This is a spark of a new rebellion. This is a spark that ignites a revolution, not my will, but yours be done. Everything that your life will be and my life will be hinges on what we do with this. Everything hinges on what we will do with this. And, and my suggestion is that we risk it all. But at the end of the days, we'd be able to say, oh, I think we will, not what we'll be able to, we will say, if we live this way, we will say, I'm glad I did. I have no regrets about where I've lived that way. My only regrets are where I haven't lived that way. God's calling you to live surrendered to Christ. He's calling me, even if you've been around a while, he's calling you and he's calling me, he's calling us to live surrendered to Jesus. That's what he wants to go on, to give up, to give all, to submit, to surrender. That's what it's about. I surrender all. And what it's really saying is this, I'm all in with God. I surrender all. It's saying I'm all in with God. Now, as I wrap, let me give you a thought. I don't know if you've ever been to a blackjack table, but I'm sure you've all seen the scene we're about to see. Seen it in a movie. Hopefully not lived it yourself and lost it all. But this is what we're saying today. This is what sparks and starts a new revolution. Jesus calls us to a surrendered life. To surrender all. To live all in with him. And really what it is, is I'm saying, all my chips are in. Everything, I'm sure you've seen the scene. Everything, God is in with you. I, everything is on the table. If I'm going to risk it, I'm going to risk it all with you. But he, here's the challenge. Is, is, is People will say, I surrender all, I'm all in with you. But there's something they hold back. It's like, uh, and, and I don't know what it is for you. It could be anything. It, if it's happening, it could be. You know, uh, the commitment to live a holy and separated life that the Bible talks about could be a commitment, you know, gathering together with God's people. You go, yeah, I love Jesus, but I'm not his people. Um, yeah, I'm going to keep that back. Could be what he says about, you know, finance. And you go, yeah, I'm, I'm all in, but I just, I'm not there yet. And this is where we move from I'm not there yet to in the zone of having revolution go on. It's this, it's this. It's moving away from this. Yeah, I'm up for that. It's moving away from that and doing this. It's going, God. I am all in. I'm all in. There is nothing back here. It's all in your hands, God. My life is yours. I'm up for this. I surrender all. I'm all in with you. And in that place, revolution can go on. That revolution, that transforms who we become. 
that profoundly affects what we're all about and that forever changes what our future holds. And if you and I will go there today in our heart, God will work a revolution in us. But I think there's something, there's a whisper of the Spirit that He'd work way beyond that in our lifetime. And we get to live it and see it come to pass, something that nobody saw coming, that you have to listen to the whisper of the Spirit to see happen. So let me pray. And then Bron's going to come. Why don't you hold your hands out like this for me? In fact, why don't you stand? I don't think... I think we can stand as long as you stay still. Bronze going to come. Just hold your hands out. Really, it's an act of surrender. It's, it's an act of going, all my chips are on the table, God. I've pushed my chips across the table. I'm all in with you. There's nothing left in my hands. I surrender everything. Let me pray. And we'll believe for the Holy Spirit to do something right now. Heavenly Father, Thank you for every person in the room, wherever we are, this room, other rooms. Lord, online today, Lord, we just pray that you, Lord, we say, I surrender all. I'm all in with you. And God, I pray as people say that in their heart and whisper it with their mouth, I just pray, God, that you would move by your Spirit and begin to do a work over in this moment and across this six weeks that work revolution in people's life, that will transform who they're becoming, what they're about and all that's in their future. In Jesus' Name we pray, Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Take a seat.